of a quorum. And Councilor Zakem. Madam President, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, I would like all guests and colleagues and staff to please rise as our lovely clerk takes us through the invocation today. And I ask that everyone remain standing after the invocation for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good morning. From different places we have arrived this morning. You have gathered here, both men and women, 13 individuals as people from differing homes from various corners of our city, as people holding array of guiding life values. Different though you might be, you join together as one each and every time you convene a legislative session such as this. You join together as one each and every time you speak as a public body to prepare for the work that lies before you this day. Might you begin your time together by invoking, by inviting in three essential guides, courage, compassion, and commitment. It is by the will of God, it is from the hand of that which is the most holy by whomever you choose to call, that these three impulses dwell and grow within us. In the name of all that is in you, that has the courage to dream a healthier, less fragmented society, in the name of all that is in you that has the compassion to notice the needs and vulnerabilities of many in our community, and all that is in you that moves your hearts and your hands to help soothe that distress. In the name of all that is in you that has the commitment to believe that every single effort made on behalf of what could be matters. In the name of all of this and more, you come together to begin this day by bringing to the forefront, by inviting in, by invoking all the courage, compassion, and commitment the creation has given you. May your hearts and mind, too, be open to receiving even more as you begin this day together, as you ready yourself for all the work that is etched into your hearts, into the lives of your constituents, and into the written agenda that undoubtedly is before you. In a shared moment of silence, then may you now invoke for yourself May you invite in these three friends, courage, 
compassion, and commitment. May these three impulses thrive within you, assisting you in continuing to build a sense of community, one with the, the other around this room, and one with another out there in the city that we hold so dear. May the spirit of courage, the spirit of compassion, and the spirit of commitment sustain you, your families, and your constituents through all that today and tomorrow will bring. So may it be said, Shalom, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you again, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> At this time, I invite Councillor Flynn up, who has a special presentation. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you to my colleagues. I want to thank Councillor Wu and Councillor Janey for joining me. Uh, the reason for, for this presentation is to recognize um, CM Gabru, but also to recognize the outstanding work of the Ethiopian community here in Boston. Ethiopians and Ethiopian Americans have played a key role in our city. Boston um, has welcomed this community. Uh, the Ethiopian community has contrib contributed greatly in the arts and culture at our universities and businesses in various cultural organizations across Boston and across Greater Boston. We're proud as a city of the outstanding contributions they have made to our city and made to our country. And we're proud of the Ethiopian community and their role here in the civic life of Boston. I'm proud to be uh, joined by my colleagues and I want to ask Councillor Wu or Councillor Janey, uh, before we introduce Sam, if you'd like to offer a few words. I will just say um, many thanks to you, Sam, um, for your leadership and your commitment to our community. Thank you. And similarly, we had a, a, a very lovely, beautiful flag raising on the plaza over the weekend to prepare for the Ethiopian, Ethiopian New Year in Kutatash. Um, so I want to thank Sam for making sure that whatever he's doing, he's always bringing community members with him, and it was just a great display of culture and unity and uh, the strength and beauty of Boston. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Councillors Flynn, Janie, and Wu for um, your friendship and your support. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have the real honor of organizing uh, for the last four years, the um, Ethiopian flag raising ceremony that we have uh, at Boston City Hall Plaza. Um, and just to say a few words about that, um, you know, I uh, have lived in the United States for over 20 years. I came here as a kid. Um, and I've always been jealous of these other immigrant communities that can put off a really good show, you know? So whether it's the Greek community or the Italians or the Haitians, the Dominicans, the Puerto Ricans and others, you know, they, they have the ability to really put on a show. And so a few years ago, um, I said, you know, well, instead of complaining, uh, let me try to put something together. And so in 2015, uh, we organized uh, the first Ethiopian flag raising ceremony uh, for the city of Boston. It was a lovely, lovely Sunday afternoon. Uh, and since then, we've continued the tradition to mark the Ethiopian New Year. Uh, Ethiopia, as some of you may know, um, is a very ancient country. It has over 5,000 years of civilization. It's uh, the, one of the oldest continuously surviving countries in the world. It's the oldest in Africa and uh, one of the only in the world that have never been colonized as well. Uh, for any of you coffee lovers here, it's also the uh, birthplace of coffee. It's actually the only place in the world where the coffee bean grows wild, um, and it's also the birthplace of humanity. So there's a lot to celebrate here, uh, but unfortunately in the United States and in much of the West, 
what we know of Ethiopia is uh, as a place that's uh, ravaged by war, famine, and, and uh, AIDS. And so that's not the complete story, of course. And so uh, as uh, Ethiopians that live, work, play, and innovate in the city of Boston, uh, I felt like it was important to bring the community together and have a space where we could uh, uh, come together um, um, at City Hall Plaza and celebrate the new year. So uh, tomorrow, Ethiopia begins the uh, year of 2012. Uh, so for all of you who may have had regrets back then, you can you know go ahead and amend things. You can relive the year 2012. Um, and uh, and uh, it follows its own calendar. It's very similar to the ancient Julian calendar, and it's based off of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church's calculations of um, of uh, the world, but uh, I just want to thank um, uh, these counselors and all of you uh, today for uh, coming together and for uh, recognizing the Ethiopian New Year of 2012. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, throughout uh, the coming year, uh, you will find that this is your best year yet. So thank you so much for the time uh, that you've given me. Uh, and then I do have a special gift uh, to all of you counselors, uh, uh, Ethiopia US lapel pin. Uh, some of you may have received them from prior events with me, uh, but I have 13 here and I don't know what the protocol is, but I'm happy to give them um, uh, to all of you as well. Thank you. Could all the colleagues join us for a picture? to be with you. Um, thank you, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Wu, and um, uh, Councillor Janey for that special presentation. Uh, moving on to the regular order of business. Uh, moving on to the approval of the minutes. If there are no corrections to be made, the minutes of the last council meeting will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objection, the minutes are so approved. Moving on to communications from His Honor the Mayor. Docket number 1264, message and order approving home rule petition to the general court entitled, an act to authorize the Boston Redevelopment Authority to grant easements for utility purposes over a portion of a certain parcel of land located in the city of Boston. Docket 1264 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Docket number 1265, message and order authorizing the issuance of tax exempt refunding bonds, a principal amount not to exceed $150 million in order to pay the principal redemption premium, if any, and interest on the bonds of other obligations to be refunded and other costs. Docket 1265 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket number 1266, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $3,328,317 in the form of a grant for the FY20 Public Safety Answering Point awarded by the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund costs associated with providing enhanced 911 services. Docket 1266 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 1267. <clears throat> Excuse me. Message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $1,808,230 in the form of a grant for the FFY20 
Title III C nutrition awarded by the United States Department of Health and Human Services passed to the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund home delivered and congregate meals for seniors in Boston. Docket 1267 will be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Docket number 1268, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of one, one I'm sorry, $1,019,659.68 in the form of a grant for the FY20 State Elder Lunch Program awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund meals for seniors in Boston. Docket 1268 will be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could read Docket 1269 through 1272 together. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Docket number 1269, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $966,932 in the form of a grant for the FFY20 Title IIIB Supportive Services. Awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs, to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund a comprehensive and coordinated health and social service system, which assists elders to maintain independent living in their communities as long as desired. Docket number 1270, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $491,552 in the form of a grant for the FFY20 Title III E caregivers awarded by U.S. Department of Health and Human Services passed to the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant would fund subgrants for caregiver services to seniors and to grandparents raising their grandchildren. Docket number 1271, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of 400000 Six hundred, I'm, I'm sorry, four hundred thousand six hundred ninety-four dollars in the form of a grant for the FFY 2020 Title Three A Area Plan Administration, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs, to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund administrative expenses on Age Strong Commission, as the Boston <coughs> Area Agency on Aging. And docket number 1272, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $171,242 in the form of a grant for the FFY20 Title III Ombudsman awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund services and advocacy for seniors in nursing homes. Dockets 1269 through 1272 will be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Docket number 1273, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $106,250 in the form of a grant for Boston College Neighborhood Improvement Fund awarded by Boston College to be administered by the Transportation Department. The grant will fund two new blue bike stations in Brighton. Docket 1273 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket number 1274, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $78,825 in the form of a grant for Title III-D, Preventive Health 2020, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund information and services to improve the health of seniors in Boston. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I rise today to ask for suspension and rules and adoption of docket or passage of docket 1274, which, which is a message in order authorizing Boston to accept and expend the amount of $78,825 in the form of a grant for the Title III slash D Preventive Health 2020. The grant was awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs and will be administered by our own Age Strong Commission. 
This grant will allow for the Age Strong Commission to fund health promotion and prevention programs to advise seniors on several health matters, including mental health, chronic disease, as well as preventive care. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley, who's chair of the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1274. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1274 has passed. Docket 1275, message in order authorizing the city to adopt a property tax exemption for members of the National Guard and reservists who are serving in foreign countries. The city of Boston initially adopted the exemption in fiscal year 2012, and by law, this local option must be extended by a vote of the city council every two years. The city of Boston shall offer a property tax exemption up to 100% for active members of the National Guard and Reservists. Docket 1275 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam President, I'll read Docket 1276 through 1278. That'd be great, thank you. Thank you. Docket number 1276, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment yeah. of Camilio Alvarez as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring January 1st, 2024. Docket number 1277, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Robert Freeman as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring January 1st, 2024. And docket number 1278, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Yuka Holmes as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring April 1st, 2023. Dockets 1276 through 1278 will be assigned to the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events. Docket number 1279, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Dr. Theodore Landsmark as a member of the Boston Redevelopment Authority and Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston, known as EDIC, Board of Directors, for a term expiring August 15th, 2024. Docket 1279 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, moving on to reports of public officers and others. Would you like me to read 1280 through 1286? That would be great. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thanks. Docket 1280, notice is received from Councilor Savvy George for absence in the city from Sunday, August 25th, 2019 until Tuesday, August 27th, 2019 to visit safe consumption sites in Toronto, Canada. Docket number 1281, notice was received from Councilor O'Malley of his absence in the city from Sunday, August 25th, 2019 until Tuesday, August 27th. 2019 to visit safe consumption sites in Toronto, Canada. Docket number 1282, notice was received from Council Siomo of his absence in the city from Sunday, August 25th, 2019 until Tuesday, August 27th, 2019 to visit safe consumption sites in Toronto, Canada. Docket number 1283, notice was received from Councilor Savvy George regarding a request to amend docket number 0258 order for a working session regarding opioid crisis. I don't, I think she's going to speak. No, we can actually go and then oh, I'll, okay. I'll go back to Wonderful. you. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Um, docket number 1284, notice is received from Council Garrison of her resignation from the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery. Docket number 1285, notice is received from the Mayor of the Appointment of Evandro Cavallo as Executive Director of Human Rights Commission effective August 26, 2019, and docket number 1286, notices received from the Mayor of the appointment of John Tagliatella as the Director of Evaluation of the Assessing Department July 13, 2019. Dockets 1280 through 1286 will be placed on file. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to speak to docket number 1283 uh, regarding my qu request to amend docket number 0258 to add a fourth bullet so it is um, <coughs> so we're able to cover this topic in particular in my public working sessions around the opioid crisis. And that is uh, so that we can discuss publicly a, and convene to report the findings uh, regarding a recent trip to both supervised injection facilities in Toronto Canada, as well as the conversations around uh, public health. I would uh, like to state for the record that neither the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery, nor the Council 
as a whole body has taken a formal position on the opening of safe injection facilities or super, supervised con consumption sites in the city of Boston. In my own capacity as a public official, as an elected official, I am on the record as being opposed to safe consumption sites or supervised injection facilities. My stance has not changed, but I do think it's uh, imperative and uh, critical that we note for the record that this body nor the committee I chair on homelessness, mental health, and recovery has taken a position. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Asabi George. Uh, moving on to reports of committees. Docket number 0666, the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, to which was referred on April 24, 2019. Docket number 0666, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $262,763 on the form of a grant for the 2019 Senior Companion Program awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to be administered by the Elderly Commission submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. On August 28th, we heard three dockets, two of which were under the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. This is the first uh, of those two, and then we'll get into another one from the Environment Committee. Uh, this is, of course, docket 0666. I wanted to thank Council <coughs> Ed Flynn and Kim Janey for their participation and input in the hearing. Uh, Age Strong Commissioner Emily Shea, as well as Deputy Commissioner of Finance, Francis Thomas testified on behalf of the administration. Docket 666 authorizes $262,763 for the Senior Companion Program, which helps older adults live independently. The program matches volunteers over the age of 55 living 200, under 200% 200 of the poverty guidelines with older seniors in need of miscellaneous help and companionship. The grant funds the stipends of the volunteers as well as meal and travel reimbursements as well as administration expenses. The program currently has 66 volunteers at 15, uh, at between 15 and 20. It fluctuates partner organizations throughout the city uh, that serve as volunteer stations. This is a great program that really helps deal with um, loneliness that can often be detrimental to so many of our seniors. So I'm really delighted that the city's taken such a proactive approach to not only identifying it, working on it, but identifying some revenue streams to pay for it. So uh, look forward to passage of this docket. Um, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Council O'Malley, who chairs the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0666. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0666 has been passed. Docket number 0667, the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, to which is referred on April 24, 2019, docket number 0667, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $130,253 in the form of a grant for the Retired Senior Volunteer Program, RSVP, awarded by the Corporation of National and Community Service to be administered by the Elderly Commission, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. This uh, docket 667, uh, which authorizes $165,303.60 for the Retired Senior Volunteer Program, or RSVP for short. This is similar to the docket we just discussed, 0666. However, uh, in terms of it engages volunteers over the age of 55 to deliver food, serve as bus buddies, help veterans in their community, as well as provide other support to homebounder seniors uh, with disabilities. Uh, the original docket, when this was listed, uh, they listed the amount of $130,253. However, since the docket's filing, the commission received an increase to the base amount for the grant. Uh, that's why the number's a little bit different, about $35,000 increase, but we went over that at the hearing, and the change is reflected in the committee report before you today. Uh, the grant funds administrative staff expenses as well as travel reimbursement for this volunteer program. It doesn't have the same stipend or one-on-one -on -one, um, volunteerism the way the prior docket does, but nevertheless, it. Uh, employs a lot more volunteers or takes uh, uh, works with a lot more volunteers. There's, the program goal has 350 volunteers around the city and there are 40 different volunteer stations. Uh, again, similarly to the last docket, this is something that the Age Strong Commission has really led on the way of peer-to-peer uh, -peer support among seniors and making sure that we have great opportunities for volunteerism as well as support programs in place. I, and I recommend passage once again. 
Thank you, Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley, who's chair of the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, recommends acceptance of the committee report and that docket 0667 pass in a new draft. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0666, docket 0667 uh, <coughs> passes in a new draft. Thank you. We can move on to the next one. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket number 0866, the Committee on Environment, Sustainability, and Parks, to which is referred on June 5th, 2019, docket number 0866. Message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $350,000 in the form of a grant for the Boston <coughs> Digital Archaeological Pro Project awarded by the National Endowment for the Humanities to be administered by the Environment Department. The grant will fund salaries for an archaeologist to collect data and digitize findings and make them accessible to scholars and the general public. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Additionally, since we last met, the Committee on Environment and Par Sustainability and Parks held a hearing on Docket 0866, which is an order authorizing the City of Boston to accept a $350,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to be administered by the Environment Department, which will fund an archaeologist to collect data and digitize archaeological findings. City archaeologist Joe Bagley provided a brief overview and stated that the funding will digitize five archaeological sites that were excavated from the 1980s and 1990s. The five sites included are the Boston Common, Fannel Hall, Brook Farm, the Paul Revere House, and 27 to 29 Endicott Street in the North End. Uh, with the very sad news in my district yesterday, I may see if we can get Doyle's Cafe listed as well and get some archaeological uh, preservation out there. Uh, there will be an estimated 210,000 artifacts will be properly cataloged and included in the digitization effort. Some of you were here when I did the council luncheon several years ago with Joe Bagley. Um, he is an absolute treasure in this city. He's our city archaeologist. This gives him some much needed support and staffing to really catalog so much of our history. There is so much history in this city, a nearly 400 year old history. Uh, it's really exciting to see this significant grant which will, will allow for additional staffing, digitization, and one mm. thing I had asked which they were amenable to is we take some of these artifacts and we do a traveling show around the city, use our libraries, our police station, certain areas just to really show off some of the incredible deep, rich, and powerful history that this city has. So this is a grant that I'm very, very excited for and look forward to prompt adoption uh, and see, uh, looking forward to seeing it put into action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to echo what Council O'Malley mentioned. Um, it was a great hearing, and um, Joe did a tremendous job working in the division, um, working with various departments to make sure that the history of Boston is shared with everybody. Joe Bagley and his and many volunteers were working this summer in Chinatown at a, at a dig, and they were finding various artifacts over the last 50, 100 years, and it's a way for us to remember our history and to learn from our history. So I, I just want to echo what Councilor O'Malley mentioned, that it's a great, um, a great department, and I know this funding will really, really help um, other people learn the history of Boston. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, at this time, Councillor O'Malley, who's chair of the Committee on Environment, Sustainability, and Parks, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0866. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0866 has been passed. Uh, moving on to uh, matters recently heard for possible action. Docket number 1051, message in order to declare surplus city-owned former transportation department parcels with vacant land and transfer the care, custody, management, and control of said property to the Public Facilities Commission. The land is located at 40-50 Warren Street in Roxbury District, Ward 8, parcels 0255. Zero, 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 zero. And this will require a roll call vote. Right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll invite the district councilor whose district this parcel is in to chime in as well. Uh, we had a very informative hearing on this particular surplus order. Uh, 
40-50 Warren Street in Roxbury is currently a, parking, a municipal parking lot of 25 parking spaces. There's been a process through Plan Deadly and uh, with the Roxbury Oversight Committee and many other community groups over the last two years um, to determine the future of this particular parcel in a group of four. We heard in the presentation that this parcel um, will be activated with 24 rental units at 66% affordable, 66% uh, of which will be affordable. Eight units will be at 50% of AMI. Eight units will be at 80% of AMI. The six floors in total will include retail space and restaurant space on the first floor, as well as residential and co-working space distributed throughout. Um, the city of Boston will not be receiving uh, will be receiving $100 from the developer who has been designated through a, a public process. Uh, really, the, the benefit for the community is around affordability. So we have had this conversation in the community, and uh, this is really the final step. And I just want to note that this is the order in which we should have these conversations with the council, that our vote to formally uh, dispose of the parcel should come after all the pieces with the community, <coughs> with RFPs, with developers, and all the negotiations have happened, so that we can know what we are truly voting on. Uh, so I will turn it over to the district councilor to weigh in. Thank you. Oh, Thank and you. I'll move for a vote on this docket. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Uh, thanks so much, Madam President, and I want to thank Councilor Wu for her leadership and sharing um, the hearing yesterday. Um, as she already stated, it is a parcel that is out uh, for bid. There is a uh, development team that has put forth a proposal um, that has uh, 24 rental units as well as affordable units. Mm -hmm. um, the retail space will be really important in terms of activating uh, Dudley Square and supporting the existing businesses that are there. Uh, it's been a robust process in terms of engaging uh, the community. Um, whether we're talking about the RFP that went out as well as since the RFP has gone out. And so I uh, stand to encourage um, that this order ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Janey. Uh, at this time, Councillor Wu, who is the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation, recommends uh, acceptance of a committee report and passage of docket 1051. This requires a roll call vote. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards, Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Clarity, Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Garrison, yes. Councilor Garrison, yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem, yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, we have 12 votes in the affirmative and one absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1051 has passed. Docket number 1106, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept an expanded amount of $1,500,000 in the form of a municipal vulnerability preparedness program action grant awarded by the Massachusetts <laughs> Executive Office of <clears throat> energy, excuse me, energy and Environmental Affairs. The purpose of the grant is to facilitate preliminary design, technical analysis, and pre-permitting for proposed climate resilient capital improvements to the Joseph Moakley Park located in the neighborhood of South Boston. Council Malley, of the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, Thank the Committee you. on uh, uh, Environment, Sustainability, and Parks held a hearing on Docket 1106. We were joined by Chief of Environment and <coughs> Space Chris Cook, Aldo Guerin, who is a planner with the Parks Department, as well as Allison Perlman, the project manager of this. I want to thank particularly the host councillor from District 3 for being there, as well as the neighboring councillor from District 2 for being there for their participation and their input. This is a really exciting grant opportunity, and I'm delighted to vote, speak favorably upon it today. Docket 1106 authorizes a $1.5 million for the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program Action Grant, the MVP. We are all about acronyms in the Committee on Environment and Open Space this day. 
Uh, the grant was awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and the purpose of the grant is to facilitate the preliminary design, technical analysis, and pre-permitting for proposed climate resilient capital improvement to the Joseph Moakley Park located in South Boston. There will be a design and implementation of a nature-based berm to address the 40 inches of sea level rise. Uh, and one priority that was discussed by both the District 2 and District 3 Council was to maintain a robust, robust community engagement through this process, particularly with the neighboring Mary Ellen McCormick housing development community. I recommend that docket 01106 ought to pass. Or docket 1106. Okay. Thank you, Council Riley. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. And thank you, Madam President. I want to say thank you to Councilor O'Malley for his leadership on this issue. I also want to say thank you to Councilor Frank Baker as well and my colleagues in the state legislature, Senator Nick Collins, Representative David Beal, as well as our, our Congressman Stephen Lynch. Um, Joe, Mo Joe Moakley Park is an incredible park um, that's util utilized by so many uh, people across our city. Um, my son played Babe Ruth baseball there this summer, and during that period of time, we saw people playing tennis at an international soccer tournament. There was uh, people jogging on the track, playing football, lacrosse, so it's well utilized, but I also want to make sure that when we go forward with planning of the park, that our coaches, our parents, and people that use the park every day are also involved in the planning process as well. Again, I want to say thank you to um, Councilor O'Malley and my colleagues in the legislature, and especially to um, City Councilor Frank Baker. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Okay. Um, at this time, Councilor O'Malley, who's the chair of the Committee on Environment, Sustainability, and Parks, seeks uh, acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 1106. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1106 has been passed. Um, before we move on, I just quickly wanted to acknowledge uh, some folks who are here, starting with you know, our police officers and detectives, uh, hardworking city employees, and some of the representatives from the uh, BP, or the unions from some of our public safety agencies. Thank you for being here. I also want to acknowledge all of the hard worker, hardworking people from Local 26 Unite Here. Thank you also for being here. Moving on to motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 1287, Councilor Garrison offered the following resolution in support of the Boston Police Department and the Boston Patrolmen's Association. Councilor uh, Garrison, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to make a motion to uh, substitute new language in this resolution. As have, I travel across the city. Have we received the okay. new language? Oh, oh, let me take a quick recess. Oh. Thank you, Council Garrison. Apologies for that. Everyone should have a copy. It's actually just a minor correction yeah. for the most part. It's adding a language or adding language at the end saying that a copy of the resolution should be forwarded, will be forwarded um, to some parties. Thank you, Councilor Garrison. As I travel across the city of Boston each and every day, I have sadly heard that many rank and file Boston police officers and members of the Boston Police <laughs> Department administration feel unsupported and unfairly criticized, even by politicians, for the selfishness service they provide to keep Boston <clears throat> safe. Hearing this along with recent events in our city where there has been drastic increase in unnecessary violence, animosity, antagonism toward the very 
people who are tasked with protecting and defending us caused me to rise in support of the Boston Police Department and the Boston Police Patrolman Association. While freedom of speech and right to peaceful protest must always be res respected, committing crime of assault against Boston police officers must not be tolerated. As elected officials, we have a moral obligation to partner with the Boston Police Department in upholding the law of order and peace throughout the city. So I ask that Boston City Council go on record to offer our unwavering support to the Boston Police Department and the Boston Poli Patrolman Association in their work to keep Boston safe. Thank you, Madam President, and I ask that the rules be suspended and passage of this resolution. Thank you, Councilor Garrison. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Oh. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, when I read this resolution, uh, my first thought was, you know, if there's ever a moment where our police officers, those who are willing to put their life on the lines, when they do feel unappreciated and, and disrespected by uh, individuals, then it's, you're right, Councilor Garrison, it is our job to demonstrate to them that we absolutely support them. So um, I'm going to go on record and support and say thank you to Nora Bastion, to Captain McCormick, mm -hmm. to Captain Fong, Sergeant Luongo, Sergeant Martins, <coughs> Commissioner Gross. Each one of them individually have been part of helping myself, uh, my constituents, deal with some of the hardest and most devastating and sometimes the most disgusting things. Um, I've, as a legal services attorney, I took because of police officers, I was, I was actually standing by AIDS victims who are subject to, to domestic violence. I've worked with immigrants and, the, and have been the bridge with the police officers and happily have watched the police officers deal with them with the respect and dignity that they deserved, regardless of the fact of where they were born. I have watched police officers uh, been down on, on knees to talk with three-year-olds to make sure that they felt safe and that they felt heard. I have seen the best come out of them when the worst comes out of society. So I absolutely support the Boston police officers. I absolutely support the police. I have family members who serve regularly right now in what is unfortunately called Chirac. There are police officers there who put their life on the lines where they have 70 shootings in a weekend. And I don't know that we have that many in several months. It would be devastating to me that any of these officers, any officer, my family would lose their life, be disrespected. Matter of fact, my, uh, my cousin and I, we, we have the biggest debates in many cases because he's a police officer. And uh, he, uh, he grew up in the, in the ghetto in Chicago, in Cabrini Green. Mm. He had the tough upbringing. And then he, um, he held back the fact. He told us he was a history major for years. He was embarrassed, actually. Not embarrassed, but scared about my reaction, my family's reaction about him becoming a police officer and how we would see him because I tend to go to the left, and my cousin tends to not so much. Um, we have wonderful debates because he's a police officer. We have debates because he goes in there and in the line of fire when bullets are being fired at him at the same time people in our own community are screaming at him, get the hell out of here. And he's like, I wouldn't be here if somebody didn't call me because they didn't feel safe. Again, we ask many times our police officers to rise to the occasion when society is devolving. We ask them to do that despite the fact that they're human beings and that they are amazing superheroes who come out there when no one wants them sometimes. So I absolutely support the Boston police. I absolutely support um, that they have to do the toughest job and I don't have to do that because hmm. someone else is gonna call them and they're gonna show up no matter who it is. But I don't support this resolution. I don't support this resolution because I don't believe it's actually intended to support the police. I think it's intended to support a political agenda and to kick those who are protesting or call or hold the police accountable to make them really the perpetrators. So I do not intend to support this resolution, but I continue to intend to support the Boston Police Department and the Boston police officers. And I'll meet with them individually, each and every one of them, and I did actually before this hearing, to tell them where I would stand. I respect them that en enough to say that. No surprises from me. I don't believe in doing that, but I do believe in being consistent. I do believe in holding people accountable. I do believe the police serve us, they protect us, and that we do need important conversations. So this resolution doesn't bring that about. 
this resolution doesn't help further the conversation. But I will happily be part of any conversation, any time, any place, anywhere, to make sure that the Boston police uh, feel supported, but also to make sure that people feel that they can absolutely protest and hold them accountable. So I wanted again say thank you to the officers who are here today. I did in advance tell your representatives that I would not be supporting this resolution. If at any time any of you individually feel you are disrespected by myself or my constituents, I want to be there, I want to have that conversation, and you hold me accountable. But today I cannot support this particular resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I am proud and grateful every day to live in a city that is kept safe by our first responders and by those sworn to protect and serve in the Boston Police Department. We have, I think we're maybe all of us sitting on this floor are a little bit biased, but I think objectively also we have the most professional force in the country, one that provides training and expertise for other departments in Massachusetts certainly and nationally. And I stand to condemn violence against our Boston police officers, against police officers. I stand to condemn violence in all its forms affecting residents across our city and in our neighborhoods. What makes me proudest of the Boston Police Department is that time and again, this department has stated through its leadership and through its participation in council proceedings that the philosophy should be for safety, for effective policing, that that has, has to start from a foundation of trust with the community. And that has come across in various ways again and again. Boston is home to community policing. It started here, and we maintain the commitment. And I know that all of you who are sitting in this room, who represent all of our officers, maintain that commitment and know that that is how we get to a safe city for every single person. So in light of that foundation of community trust and in reading this resolution, which references recent events, my understanding is that this is in response to events that have been in the news and most notably the straight pride event. When we talk about trust with community, I think all of us who are elected officials and serve the public in various departments do have to recognize that the LGBTQ community in particular has a history with conflicts with law enforcement, with police violence. And that's not about our day-to-day -day interactions in Boston throughout the year. It is a history that we all have to be aware of and that I think in order to use this opportunity to grow that trust with community as opposed to, to threaten it or um, create misperceptions that will affect that trust in community, I request, Madam President, that this docket receive an opportunity for public conversation in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I, I too, um, have the greatest respect for our police department in our offices that have work so hard and are so professional in keeping us safe, especially during difficult times in our city, whether it's the recent um, protest or it was during various racial periods in our city's history. It was always the, or often it was always the Boston police that took the leadership role and tried to bring people together, whether it was Tom Scott or Willis Saunders, who was a friend of mine who was a Tuskegee M. And um, Madam President, just the other day, I had the opportunity to be with um, many members of the Boston Police um, Patrolman's Association and you know, with a good friend of mine from South Boston, Rich DeVoe, um, in recognizing the 100th anniversary of the, of the Boston Police strike. And the Boston Police went on strike 100 years ago uh, the other day. They voted at the Social Club, which is in the south end of Boston, um, but they wanted to make sure that they had a decent wage. They had fair working conditions. They were working 80 hours a week, 
with one day off every three weeks, and they were paid one third less of the salary than a traditional city laborer. Um, the, sit, the strike went on for uh, a period of time, and the governor of the state, Calvin Coolidge, who basically overseen the um, Boston Police Department, um, fired the police officers. And at that time, they brought in striking police officers as replacements. But the Boston Police Department came together, and they really demanded justice, they demanded fairness, and they wanted to make sure that their families were treated with respect and dignity. They wanted to organize, just like my friends behind me wanted to organize, too. And when the Boston police did organize, they were able to um, advocate for decent wages, safer working conditions, uh, better opportunities. And they really weren't paid all that much money up until the 1980s. Um, they're, they're still not paid enough money. The, the, it's, a, it's a lot of forced overtime that these police officers are doing. It's having an impact on their family. It's a, having an impact on, um, on our city as well. I had the opportunity, as many of, many of you know, to have served overseas in the, in the military, but I also think of the police officers that were at the, at the Boston Marathon bombing several years ago, and what impact that had on them, what impact it had on their family. Do we have police officers that are suffering from PTSD like many military people do? I think those are issues that we also have to discuss as a city going forward. We can't keep delaying that. That's a critical issue. I, st I stand with the Boston police officers because the Boston police officers, in my opinion, have always been there for the residents of Boston um, as we celebrate and recognize the 100th anniversary of the, of the strike. Um, we also want to reflect on what the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association is all about. It's a, it's a union, and they're fighting for fair wages. They're fighting for decent working conditions, um, time off to spend with their family, medical care, just like every other union would. So I'm proud to stand here um, and support the police officers. Madam President, if I may make one more point, as a mm -hmm. District 2 City Councilor, I know the turmoil or tension that immigrant communities may have at times with police or uh, public safety, public safety officers. As the district city councilor who represents a large immigrant community, I think I probably spend six days a week in Chinatown um, working with the Chinese community, trying to develop better relationships with the Boston police, working closely with Captain Fong, as Councilor Edwards, Edwards mentioned. Um, but that's been a lot of my time and effort, is trying to connect the police with our immigrant community to make sure we treat everybody fairly, we treat everyone with respect. And I'm proud of the outreach the police have been making, the progress that we have been making. I think as a city, um, we really need to come together and focus on issues that really unite us, instead of these narrow issues that can divide us. Um, I think that's what Boston's all about, is looking for the goodness in people, looking for the best out of people, and not focusing on negative aspects at times of people, but bringing out what's good of our city and bringing out what's good of our neighborhoods. And um, for those reasons and many others, I, I'm proud to stand here and support the Boston Police. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I will be brief because I know we have a, a packed agenda, but appreciate the comments of all my colleagues. Appreciate uh, the at-large council for her leadership on this. Obviously, it goes without saying the men and women of the Boston Police Department and the EMS Division, BPPA EMS Division is with us as well. I um, know there are several other hearing orders that we'll get into later that will uh, be relevant to some of the issues that are discussed, but wanted to thank Councillor Garrison uh, and ask that my name be added to this resolution. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I wasn't going to say anything. I was just going to sign on. But um, my, my colleague from East Boston uh, was great in her points. And I, and I totally understand those points. But 
For myself, I've been through the clean sweep, which was the first police action, and then, and then the, the um, whatever the parade was out there, whoever they're calling themselves. The police aren't taking, a, aren't taking a stance out there on the streets. They're there to protect us. And I wonder, when is it okay to, 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 to do things like yelling in your face? I mean, we have people, we go to meetings, and we have verbal fecal matter thrown at us all the time. These guys, literally bottles of urine thrown at them. When is that not okay? When can we, when can we say to the people that are coming into Boston, you know, if we want to talk about community policing, I, I believe our police are in our communities, but it's the people coming from Vermont, Somerville, Belmont, Bellingham, Middleborough to come into our streets with weapons on them and masks on. At what point is that not okay? And at what point can we say is enough is enough? Because it's not kids from Dorchester, Roxbury, and South, and South Boston out there. There were some kids out there. But I don't think that our kids are out there with masks on and bats under them and, th and, and throwing bottles of urine at our police. So I want to sign on to this, please. And thank you, for, thank you for this today. And I believe that there's a couple things on, on the docket today that will get us into this, into this conversation here. So I would like to move this forward and, and vote for this resolution in the, in the, in the um, resolutions, the orders for hearings. I think we will be able to discuss, discuss this in coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Add the name. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flynn, uh, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley. Um, did I miss anyone in terms of adding names? At this time, because there's been an objection on the floor with respect to the resolution, and when you suspend the rules, the rules say that everyone, because it's a suspend and pass, um, and it's been in introduced to the council for the first time, everyone has to be on board. So this has to go to committee for further discussion. It will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket and I guess just to clarify, that's docket 1287 that would be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Thank you, Madam President. Docket number 1288, Councilors Baker, Campbell, and Wu offer the following order for hearing to discuss a Little Saigon Cultural District designation in Fields Corner. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. This is something that, I, so I was elected in 2012. Do I got to redo? Yeah. <laughs> Under Ethiopian um, In the Ethiopian <laughs> calendar, I do. Um, and, and this has been the talk in the Vietnamese yeah. community in, in yeah. Fields Corner for my entire time on the, on the council, and you share Fields Corner with me, so thank you for signing on, and also Councilor Wu. Boston is the largest population of Vietnamese Americans in, in Massachusetts, and of those 9,403 foreign-born Vietnamese Americans, three-quarters of them are living in Dorchester. The majority of Vietnamese American residents, businesses, and community programs are concentrated along Dorchester Avenue in Fields Corner. The first Vietnamese American community center in the country was built in Dorchester in 1994. And a cultural designa district designation aims to attract more business and tourism to the area. This hearing order will be an opportunity to hear from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the City of Boston, the Little Saigon, Little Saigon Cultural District Advisory Committee, and the residents to hear the comments and questions and concerns. One of the things that was the issue in Fields Corner, the, the, the people in Fields Corner were concerned that they were going to lose their identity to a Little Saigon district. I argue, we argue that within Fields Corner there is a Little Saigon district to promote the Vietnamese community there. One of the good things that's coming out of this is, is the, um, the Little Saigon Cultural District Advisory Committee will be partnering with the, um, the Main Streets group because one of the issues that Main Streets has is connecting on to the Vietnamese mm -hmm. businesses because they don't have enough translators and, and they're not, their messaging is incorrect. So I see this as a positive. We'll bring, the, we'll bring the meeting right into Fields Corner so we can have everybody there, all stakeholders there, to voice their, their comments, questions, and concerns. Thank you, and I turn it over to the, to the co-sponsors. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Baker. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to uh, the District Councilor for his partnership on this. This is a designation that the community I know has been seeking for a long, long time, just recognition of how much vibrancy in Fields Corner and um, even more throughout Dorchester really is because of the contributions, the businesses, the um, cultural events, the uh, 
commitment to community that comes from our Vietnamese American community in Dorchester and in Boston. Um, so a lot of work has already gone into the proposal to this point. Um, there's been a committee on the, the community side that has drawn up the walkable map for, that would qualify for the Mass Cultural Council's designation. It includes restaurants, um, small businesses, cultural centers, and this next step is for the council to really be the platform for community to weigh in. Um, so I'm really excited. I know they have had meeting after meeting after meeting in the community, and uh, this would follow several other cultural districts that the council has participated in and supported and advanced. Most recently, the Roxbury Cultural District, and then also uh, Boston's Latin Quarter and Councilor Malley's district, as well as the Fenway Cultural District and um, the Boston Literary Cultural mm -hmm. District around the Copley Library and, and uh, Back Bay. So uh, very excited to keep going on this and um, looking forward to a conversation that will, uh, I think, be out in the community on this topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Wu. And I'll just quickly add, really excited to partner with both of you on this. Um, Council Baker, of course, we split Dorchester in half, um, including Fields Corner. Um, and our partners, uh, I appreciate the partnership and the work there. It's, it's not an easy uh, district. There's a lot of uh, things going on. But this is a unique opportunity to have a hearing that will talk about the tremendous value um, that our Vietnamese Americans bring, not only in Fields Corner and particularly in Dorchester, and they've been there for a very long time, um, and what they contribute to the economy and the culture there, but across the entire city of Boston. So really excited for the conversation, and thank you both for the partnership. Um, anyone else? Oh, I apologize. Councilor yeah. Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I just want to um, highlight the role of Councilor Baker and Councilor Wu and Council President Campbell on representing the Vietnamese and Vietnamese community extremely well. And I'd also like to recognize um, our city clerk, who also recognized, represented the Vietnamese community mm -hmm. very well as a district city councilor in Dorchester. So we've had great leaders in the city, um, always there for the Vietnamese and Vietnamese community. So I just want to say thank you to my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would you like to add your name? Y yes, okay. Madam, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add uh, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Garrison, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Malley, Councilor Zakem. Uh, docket 1288 will be assigned to the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events. And I just want to quickly acknowledge that we have a state representative who's sort of hiding way in the back. That's why I didn't see him, Tommy Vitolo. Thank you for being here also with Local 26. Um, are, are you a state rep too? I see you raising your hand in the back. No. <laughs> but it's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Local 26 for being here. And thank you, state rep, for being here. Apologies for missing you earlier. I know you're like amongst the people, so thank you. Uh, moving on to the next docket. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket number 1289, Councils Flynn and Edwards offer the following resolution supporting children born abroad to military members and federal workers. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards for her leadership on so many veteran issues and issues impacting military families. Uh, it's been great to work with Councilor Edwards on these important issues. Um, Madam President, this is a resolution to support children born abroad to military members and federal workers serving abroad in response to a recent Trump administration policy change that would make it harder for some of these ch children to get automatic American citizenship. Before this policy change, children born abroad to parents serving in the military or working in the federal government can be considered residing on U.S. soil for immigration purposes. However, this new policy change would make it more difficult for some of these children to automatically become citizens. Children who are adopted by certain service members born abroad to parents who, are re who were recently naturalized or to parents who are U.S. citizens but not lived in the United States are also impacted. This is through the Trump administration change in immigration uh, policy. This new policy change is making it more stressful and confusing for military members and federal workers serving abroad. These men and women make tremendous sacrifice serving our country. As I mentioned, I've, I've seen so many military families 
um, abroad, whether it was in Guantanamo, Cuba, or it was in um, Japan, or throughout Europe. But these kids, these American um, children that were born on these military bases are as Americans as, as we are, as my, as my family, who are, who are a military family as well. But I just want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards for her leadership, and I know Councilor Edwards also comes from a military family, and we don't want to put more stress on military families. They go through enough as it is. They should not be uh, subjected to more hardships, more pain from our federal government in denying them citizenship. We should make it easier for someone that wants to put the military uniform on their back to serve our country, give their kids an opportunity to become American citizens, let them enjoy our country. Their parents fought for it. Their, their parents were in harm's way, and their parents sacrificed for us. Many of them now are at the VA medical hospitals um, getting care for some of their injuries. And now what are we saying to their children? That you're not <coughs> a U.S. citizen, or we're going to limit your ability to come to the United States? So these types of immigration laws are not only unfair, they're mean-spirited, and I think we owe it. We don't owe anything to our military families. They've earned it. But let's treat them with the respect and dignity that they've earned and that the sacrifice they've made for our country. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and I wanted to thank Councillor Flynn for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, resolution. Um, as, as many of you know, my mother served in the military, the U.S. Air Force, for 23 years. I was born in a military base, actually in Florida, but it looks like if it was two years later and I was born on mm -hmm. Heathrow, which is where we ended up going, and then Lake and Heath in, uh, in England, that this kind of policy would have put uh, my family, my citizenship, my sister's citizenship in question. I understand that there's been some attempt to clarify that this would actually be a smaller portion of individuals, that, this, that some of the kids would be the, only the kids who were adopted, but those kinds of exceptions and those kind of walkbacks miss the point. If you are serving in, this, in the military, you are placed abroad, okay? You, you may choose sometimes locations, but ultimately it's the decision of the U.S. military to put you and your family abroad. And so when you are put abroad to defend this country, you should not be denied in any way, shape, or form citizenship to your kids, whether you adopt them, whether they, uh, whether what your citizenship status is, the law should remain the same, which is that you are serving the United States. One of the very basic understandings is when you are on that military base, you are in the United States. And that is all that we're asking, is that we maintain the course and what we have been doing, because it's the most respectful thing you can do. I've said many times, it is not just the service member that is serving this country. We serve as well, the children, the wives, the husbands, the brothers, the mothers, we serve as well. We serve either waiting for our loved ones to come home and sometimes we're the only ones there to receive that coffin. We also serve in many cases when we are sitting there waiting, my, myself when Iraq 1 happened and we had to deal with the fact that our parents, our family members, our neighbors were going off to war and we had therapy groups for us as children on the military base. It's a special community of amazing families, of amazing patriots who live on military bases who serve this country. All of my friends are from all over this world, especially those who grew up in those military bases, and no one questioned their patriotism, no one questioned their love of this country. And this kind of policy does just that, by virtue of the fact that their parents were placed abroad to serve this country. So I vehemently oppose any attempt to try and curtail or pull back citizenship, especially when we're talking about military children, children of military service members. And I just wanted to thank again Councillor Flynn for your support, your unwavering support for those who serve in this, in the military, who come home. And I just want to say everything you do, you're literally telling them welcome home. And we respect you. And I thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, anyone else looking to speak on this uh, matter? or add their name. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Baker, Councillor Siomo, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Janey, Councillor McCarthy, Council Malley, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakum, as well as the Chair. Uh, Councillor, Councillors Flynn and Edwards seek suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1289. All those in favor of passage say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1289 has been passed.
Docket number 1290, Councillors Edwards and Flynn offer the following resolution supporting workers at Battery Walk Hotel. Councillor Flynn, you want to speak first? Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. On this, um, on this resolution. Madam President, um, Local 26 members are, are right behind us. Um, they recently went out on strike at Battery, at Battery Wharf, which is located in, uh, in the North End. And what these workers are seeking to do is they want to be treated fairly. They want to be treated with respect and dignity. They want a fair, a fair wage. They want decent working conditions. They want to make sure that their families also have the opportunity for the American dream, just like, just like everybody else does. They work hard. They, they're really the first people that tourists come when they come to Boston is they see these wonderful professional people, workers, who are doing an outstanding job for our city and for our state, and they're not getting paid the, the salary that they they deserve. Um, they're taken advantage of by the by this company. Um, they're not respected by the hotel. And this this body has always stood for the working men and women of our city, especially low wage workers, our immigrant community, um, men and women that need government on their side to advocate for them. And I think that's what this body has always done effectively has been there to fight for those without a voice and fight for those that need, need our assistance. I'm proud to support Local 26, and we've always supported um, the members of the hotel and restaurant workers because they've always supported the people of Boston. <coughs> they make our city better. They make our country better. They're always contributing. They're always giving back. They're our school teachers. They're our PTA. They're our Little League coaches. They work so hard and they contribute so much and sacrifice so much without little recognition and often with disrespect from a, a major company um, that they're working for. So I'm proud to stand here and support Local 26. I'm proud to support the working men and women of this excellent union. And our immigrants deserve a fair contract our working men and women deserve a fair contract. We also want to make sure that this strike um, is also about making sure that our communities of color are also treated fairly, are also treated with respect. And I don't think, unfortunately, this company is doing that right now. And that's the role of the Boston City Council, is to stand up for people that need our support. And they certainly do, and they've, they've earned it, and I'm just proud of the outstanding work Local 26 and the hotel and restaurant workers have done for our city for so many years. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to have a few more speakers, so I ask that we hold applause um, to maybe the end, um, so because there's clearly some excitement here. So um, I'll go through quickly, and then we'll take a vote on this resolution. Um, so thank you again, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. I wanted to, again, thank Councillor Flynn for his leadership. Um, to the members here today, I just want to say, looking at you is absolutely, I think, one of the most beautiful group of folks I've ever seen. I think you represent, honestly, Boston. I look at the diversity, I see women, I see men, I see all colors, I see workers, I see immigrants, and I see our future in your faces. And so standing with you and standing by your side, uh, standing by working families, it's what we do in Boston. You make us a stronger, a better city because of the hard work that you do that is oftentimes unrecognized, it's not valued, and it's not seen. And I see not only in you, but I see uh, your families who are standing with you, because going on strike is a brave, incredible, courageous thing to do. It is not easy. And yes, you stand together, but a lot of what's also unseen is the fact that your kids 
your husbands, your wives, all of them are standing with you too. It's an amazing thing to watch this kind of solidarity because God knows we need to see it. We need to see workers standing up, being unapologetic for the rights, for the diversity, and making sure that this world is a better place. And not only do you stand up for yourself, you stood up for student workers, you stood up for domestic workers, you stand where other workers need the support. Local 26, it's like this beat for, the, for workers' rights is, is led by you every single time. Every single time. You stand by when other, people's, when other people don't want to be there. So this speaks to the credit of your union, it speaks to the credit of your union <coughs> leadership, but it also speaks to the fact that in this world today, if we don't stand by workers, if we don't stand by you, then we are walking away from our own future and, the own, and our own health of our city. I'm so incredibly honored and proud to stand with you. You inspire and you give energy to this body every single time you step up. And so I'll be there. I know I wasn't there the first time. I'll be there. I was out of the country, actually, uh, when you started on strike. But I'll be there until the strike is over. And we're going to win. You're going to win. And I'm so proud to stand with you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Yeah, I'm sorry, Madam President. May I suspend Rule 12 and add Councillor Janey, please? Any objection? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Janey as an original co-sponsor. Thank you. Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Madam President, and many thanks to my colleagues, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Flynn, for their leadership. Uh, my deep gratitude to Local 26 uh, for creating opportunities for people in our community, working women and men, um, people in our immigrant community to get on the path to, to middle class. Um, I was recently at a family gathering uh, this past weekend and I had the opportunity to sit with my aunt who shared stories about my grandfather who worked at the Omni Parker Hotel as an elevator operator back when we had elevator operators. Uh, and when we had elevator operators, um, and when my grandfather was working at this hotel, he could not use the front door. He could not stay in this hotel. Um, and he did not have a local 26 uh, with him. So thank you for all of the work that you do every single day for working women and men. These are good jobs that we are fighting for. These are jobs that put people on the path to middle class. This, these are jobs that help people break out of the cycle of poverty, buy their first home, put their children through college, it is important that this body stand with Local 26 and our hotel workers. They do an amazing job. I was proud to be out there. The first day of the strike, I will continue to stand with them because that is what makes our community strong. When we have good jobs where people can take care of their families and their communities, that's how we win uh, in the city. And so just like our Councillor Edwards said, yes, we will win this because when we fight, we win. Uh, and one job should be enough. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. I want to uh, thank our good colleagues who sponsored this, uh, this resolution today and the men and women, the organizers, uh, the supporters uh, of Local 26 who are here with us today and who have been out on the picket lines for uh, about a week now. Is that right? Um, we're there every day and I'm sure heading back there uh, after this with what I expect will be a uh, strongly supported resolution in hand from this body. Uh, this is incredibly important uh, for the city of Boston. I know our good colleague, uh, Councilor Flynn, mentioned this earlier, that the history of labor activism in the city, going back to the police strike of 1919, I think it's important that we do have our Patrolmen's Union and Association here today as well. This is how we get good jobs. This is how we maintain good jobs in a middle class and grow our economy and challenge some of the inequities and inequalities and injustices in our community. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to stand and offer my name to be added as a co-sponsor uh, to this resolution. I was proud to join these men and women, uh, as well as our former colleague, Congresswoman Presley, on the picket line last week. Um, and we'll continue to be there. We'll be back. And we want to support Local 26 efforts because they are setting a standard for service workers in the city of Boston and beyond. They're setting a standard that one job should be enough to support a family, to stay in the city of Boston. Uh, to build a career, and we need to support that as elected officials. There's only so much that we can do as government. We need to be encouraging 
private industry. We need to be saying that in the city of Boston and hopefully beyond, at a time of growing inequality, we're going to support good jobs, good wages, with fair working conditions, where you can have health care, we can save for retirement, and where you can support a family. So I enthusiastically add my name to this, look forward to passage, and look forward to continuing to support these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jacobs. Councilor Sahib, George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I first ask to add my name to this um, to this resolution supporting our workers. Uh, when my dad first immigrated to the United States, one of his very first jobs was in the hotel industry. He was a food server, and I thought as a young child, probably similar to Councilor Janey's experience, mm -hmm. that we were wealthy because he'd come home with a with a roll of one dollar bills. And um, that one job wasn't enough because while he was working in the hotel industry, my dad also had to drive a cab. And uh, to make end meets to, end meets to support his family, um, his growing family. And for me to see all of you, uh, my dad's no longer with us, so to, to, to see you here is an opportunity to see my dad and, and the, the, the people that are just like him, immigrants to the United States, those of you uh, that have chosen to come here, who've wanted to make a life here, we owe you our support. Uh, we owe you our names to this resolution uh, to help you um, fight this cause, to, to win this battle. So again, please add my name. Congratulations to the sponsors who have uh, no doubt led the way um, through many renditions of this experience. That's unfortunate that we have to continue mm -hmm. with the chance of one job uh, should be enough. So I hope that this is uh, one, this is, of course, will be one less battle that we all have to fight, but hopefully it is uh, finally the end. Uh, so again, count me as a supporter, and uh, I look forward to uh, a celebration of an end to this. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you, Councilor Thank you. <laughs> Council, will you have the floor? Thank you, Madam President. Would you please add my name as well to mm -hmm. the, the resolution? Um, there's not much more to say. I just want to say thank you. It is brave and courageous to take on the risk of going on strike and you're doing it not just for yourselves and your families, the future that you're building for your kids and the sacrifices you're making to do that, but for kids and families all across our city and really beyond. Every time you take on a fight, Local 26, we're there with you and, and you are changing the economy, you're changing the opportunities available for people far, that you will never meet, but who uh, we join you in, in owing you a debt of gratitude for. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Lee. Um, at this time, does anyone else want to add their name? Okay, Madam Clerk, if we could add Councilor Zakem, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Wu, as well as Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, uh, who am I missing? Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley, as well as the Chair. At this time, Councillors Edwards, Janie, and um, Flynn request suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1290. All those in favor of passage say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Doubt the vote. Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Thank you. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Garrison. Yes. Councilor Garrison, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Council Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, we have 12 votes in the affirmative and one absent is remaining. Thank you. Uh, docket 1290 has been passed. Feel free to clap away. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're going to move on to the next docket. Docket number 1291. Councils Flynn and Edwards and Wu offer the following order for hearing to discuss updates on the implementation of short-term rental ordinance. 
Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. I just wanted to, um, again, thank uh, Councillor Flynn for his leadership and uh, thank Councillor Wu for her leadership, her continued leadership. You want to suspend Rule 12? Just yes. Formally add. Perfect. Thank you. I will first suspend Rule 12 and see. <laughs> Any uh, objections to adding uh, Councillor Wu as a third co-sponsor? No. Madam Clerk, if you could uh, add Councillor Wu as a third co-sponsor. Thank you and thank you, Councillor Edwards. Thank you. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, uh, again, uh, thank Councillor Flynn for his leadership and also Councillor Wu for her leadership and a demonstration of her continued leadership on this particular issue when it comes to short-term rentals. Um, I have had the privilege to be to work with both of these councillors, but especially Councillor Wu when it came to her being able to navigate what I think is one of the more complicated conversations on short-term rentals. And we got there in the end. And today, we're, um, at, after the September 1st uh, deadline, the, mm -hmm. the actual imp implementation and the full um, laws finally in effect. And I'm excited to see that, but I'm also wary of, of the fact that we need to make sure that it is actually working in the way that it was intended to work. We did express concerns that it would, could overburden some property, um, some small property owners. We were concerned that it could chase and move a lot of the issues in downtown into our neighborhoods. These are all continued conversations, and we promised our constituents that we would not just walk away from this. So. This conversation will continue, and we want to make sure that we have a hearing to really discuss, is it working the way we intended? Do we need to tweak what we passed? Do we need to make sure that it's actually protecting our neighborhoods? Or, did, are, are, we, are, or are we simply adding more regulation when it was not necessary? I think it's actually a great thing, but I'm open to other folks telling me how it is or isn't working and how best we can make sure that the short-term rental um, law that we passed, the ordinance that we passed, is truly making sure Boston is a livable city. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to Councillor Edwards and um, Council Wolf for your leadership on this issue. I also want to acknowledge the work of Mayor Walsh and his administration as well as their, uh, for their leadership on, 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 this, on this issue as well. Um, now that the lawsuit between Airbnb and the city is settled, we want to discuss any potential issues that may exist regarding enforcement, enforcement of the ordinance and, remo and the removal of investor units in large corporations that have a negative impact on our housing stock, rental market, other quality of life issues. There are recent reports from my constituents that some unregistered and potentially ineligible units are still operating. Residents in the, residents in the Boston Sun highlighted a building in the South End offering units for rent by the night through its website. Neighbors in my neighborhood of South Boston have contacted me for over a year about an investor unit in South Boston that is not a primary residence or owner occupied. We often have to call the owner and tell him to pick the trash up and mm. that there are other issues of, of, of rats and mice uh, because of the lack of track, uh, trash pickup by this owner. My office was told that this unit is now registered with the city and it's continuing to operate. I have notified Commissioner Irish and his staff as well. Recently, a corporate operator at D and First Street in South Boston held a community meeting as they seek to change 17 existing short-term rental units into executive suites, which would not free up housing units as the ordinance intended. We want to make sure that this ordinance is strictly enforced, no exceptions. So this hearing will be discussing concerns about any potential loopholes to ensure that investor owners, short-term rental units, are not displacing residents and causing quality of life issues. I have a feeling that there's a lot of these Airbnb operators that continue to exist and they're, they're not following the rules. They're having a devastating and tremendous impact on quality of life issues for residents and our neighbors, <coughs> in our neighborhoods. And we need to find out what these loopholes are and work with the various city departments to make sure that everyone is in compliance and that people are following their rules if there are Airbnb. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank the sponsors for um, partnering on this and for including me. Uh, mostly, I just wanted to congratulate 
the mayor, the administration, and especially the law department on mm. the recent settlement agreement with Airbnb after they had sued the city. Uh, when we talk about enforcement, the, what we got out of the settlement is, is a huge win, that Airbnb will now be proactively taking responsibility for helping the city remove illegal listings, as well as communicating to all of their users just what the rules are, uh, as well as sharing data with the city so that we could build up the database on our end to continue monitoring and enforcement. Um, and just a, a note on that and a reminder to the council about when we fight we win, uh, that this settlement was only possible because the city had leverage from our ordinance. We passed an ordinance that included a provision around platform liability that would fine Airbnb or any other short-term rentals platform for every instance where they were accepting, the, taking the fee for accepting an illegal listing and booking that listing. This is something that we were told and warned uh, by other cities, by the company, that we would get sued over, that we would lose over because other cities had been going through this with Airbnb. They had been using their weight, their bullying force as a large corporation to sue city after city after city to really scare other cities into not even starting with the legislation. But since we did that, and then when we won the victory from the judge who said, not only does your ordinance stand, but we are actually setting a precedent for the country in that this platform liability piece stands as well. That gave us the leverage so that the law department uh, was able to secure this huge victory for enforcement. So I'm just so excited that we are back full circle and finally talking about making it connect with the neighborhoods and following up on all the little pieces that the city needs to do to connect that legislation to actual reality um, on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wu, and thank you for your leadership. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. really important conversation that we need to follow up on. Um, so thank you for that. And just really to share what I am hearing from constituents um, is that they're, rather than having housing that was previously Airbnb become part of our housing stock and available to people who need housing, uh, instead folks are looking to create bed and breakfasts and corporate housing. So I think it's a very timely conversation. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Would you like to add your name? Oh, yes. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Janey. Anyone else want to add their name uh, to this? If you could add Councilor Janey, Councilor Asabi George. I know you're Councilor Siomo, Councilor Garrison, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Zakem, as well as the chair. Uh, let's see, docket one, one, two, nine, one would be assigned to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Docket number 1292, Council McCarthy offered the following. Order for hearing regarding prohibiting wearing a mask, hood, or other device to conceal any portion of the face to conceal the identity of the wearer upon or within public property in the city of Boston. Council McCarthy, you have the floor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, people are very concerned about the First Amendment, and I don't take narrowing of this fundamental right lightly. Uh, the Boston Herald reported that uh, civic, uh, civil rights attorney and expert Harvey Silver, Hilt Silverglade uh, stated that, and I'll paraphrase, uh, properly written, he believes it, meaning this ordinance, would pass constitutional muster. And to be fair to uh, Council Silvergate, uh, he did state he wasn't in favor of this proposal, as I am. Uh, my question is simple. When did protesting that equals violence uh, become society's norm? When did society say it was okay to throw cups of urine and bottles at police officers? When did people wake up in the morning and say, hey, let's go to a peaceful protest, but don't forget your razors and your, your keys for handcuffs and your, your face masks in case you get urine and bleach that we're throwing at the cops. You don't want to get that in your own eyes. Um, and oh, don't forget the, the trash barrel shield that I made out in the backyard. Make sure you bring that. And God forbid, don't forget to bring your mask. These aren't normal. These aren't the norms of our society. And for the safety of our first responders, all of them, EMS, fire, as well as police, uh, our civilians that are here from Boston, and the visitors that come from all over the world uh, to visit our world-class city, um, this is incredibly important. That's what this ordinance is based on. That's what this ordinance is based on. The common sense legislation that people should not be allowed to do what happened last week. That is not First Amendment speech. That is violence, and it shouldn't be stand for in the city of Boston. So I look forward, and I'm eager uh, to have it here. Thank you. Thank you, Council McCarthy. Anyone else looking to speak on this? Council Everett, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Council McCarthy, for your leadership. 
Public Safety Committee, you have led, I think, uh, this body in several difficult conversations, and I think this is only part of that as well, when we were talking about surveillance, for example, and how mm. we as a body would work with the police for any additional surveillance um, technology that they used. So this is not new, and I, and I appreciate your leadership continued. Um, I am going to sign on to this because I think it's, again, part of the conversations that you've helped to either bring about or have helped start as a, um, as a city councilor. And I want to thank you again for that. I do want to say, though, that I, I think the conversation not only should involve uh, wh whether we should be regulating or eliminating mass and protests, we should also, as part of that, make sure that we, we don't forget historical context. I, I actually think that this is part of um, uh, several ordinances that we're dealing in trying to regulate the Ku Klux Klan, for example, and why you would want to make sure that you had, if you're going to come out, you need to be out about who you are. But at the same time, we, we shouldn't assume that this is a silver bullet, nor do I think you'd, you're saying that. This is not going to eliminate violence in protesting, right? I believe a man who was open about his hatred for people of color drove, a, drove his car in that protest in, I think, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, mm -hmm. right? He was open about it. They had the tiki torches, I guess, so you could see their faces at night. I don't know what the heck they had them for, but ultimately, people have been open about their hatred before. So this is not, and I don't want to confuse folks either, saying that we're doing this to stop violence and protests, right? It is just making sure that if you're going to come and be a part of a hard, difficult conversations, you are not incentivized to do more stupid stuff, right? Because you're able to hide who you are. That's how I understand this conversation to be. And I think it's, it is important to make sure that we, we do uh, not only talk about the constitutional muster. I appreciate, um, what's his name, Mr. I don't know whoever his name is. Too yeah, I'm sure. I, yeah, I appreciate his context and understanding of the, the constitutional muster. I think it's still worth the, the continued conversation. But let's add also to that conversation. If we're going to talk about people's faces being out there, shouldn't we also be considering whether we should be regulating surveillance and face face um, facial recognition technology as well? So I think the two actually marry each other. If we're going to say show your face, do we as a body also say we would use this the facial recognition technology to make sure that we can do that? I know our our sister city Somerville is has banned or will be banning uh, the use of that facial recognition technology. I think the conversations are deeply married, and I hope that that can be part of that conversation with the several invited guests that you have, excuse me, speakers that you have for the hearing. So again, I sign on to this. It is the conversation that we need to have about what is effective protest, what is um, protest within the First Amendment, and also making sure that we are um, continuing different difficult dialogues when it comes to public safety and making sure that we are actually implementing things that keep us safe versus things regulating speech. So thank you so, so much, Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Councilor Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I want to uh, thank our good colleague, Councilor McCarthy, for uh, bringing this forward. Um, I'll be quite honest. Uh, when I first reviewed the agenda for this week, I had some serious concerns uh, about this hearing order. But I've done some historical research, some legal research, and you know, I am of the opinion that carefully considered, carefully drafted, and I think outside the context of reacting to one specific event. This is something that this body can and maybe should consider. Uh, as our good colleague, Councilor Edwards mentioned, many of the anti-mask ordinances and laws around this country came out of opposition to the Ku Klux Klan and to terrorism that was happening uh, across this country. But I want to reiterate, and I can't say this strongly enough, how important it is that any discussion about this, not just for constitutional reasons, because just because something's constitutional doesn't make a good policy. We see that over and over again. But if we're going to have a policy on this, it has to be neutral. A law of this sort cannot be enforced selectively. <coughs> needs to be enforced fairly. We need to be talking about exemptions for religious beliefs, sincerely held religious beliefs, for health reasons. We need to make sure that if this is a path that the city wants to even explore, we do it thoughtfully. And I also think stating it as a reaction, both in time and in the language uh, of this hearing order, to an incident that happened I believe, two weeks ago now, uh, the so-called straight pride parade, where there's still a lot of tension, where there's still a lot of discussion, a lot of confusion. I believe we have another hearing order coming up um, from one of our colleagues about that today. Um, is not the appropriate context for this discussion. I think is going to lead to maybe some, some raised temperatures, uh, so to speak. We could otherwise have a thoughtful discussion. So I want to uh, commend Council McCarthy for bringing this forward. It's not an easy uh, discussion to have. Um, you know, the city of Boston has a long history 
of mass protesters going back to uh, the Sons of Liberty uh, and the Boston Tea Party. Um, it's something to keep in context. Uh, there is a place for anonymity in political discourse and protest. Um, and before I ramble on and on and just give my stream of consciousness on what is a very serious uh, and timely issue, um, I just want to say whatever this body decides, whether we move forward with this hearing, if ultimately uh, Councilor McCarthy proposes an ordinance, for me, the central issues are going to be neutrality and making sure that this body, this city, exercises its oversight to make sure that this is not an ordinance or a law that is used to discriminate based on viewpoint, based on background, uh, based on political stance. So I'm not actually going to add my name right now. I want to share my thoughts on this um, and my thinking moving forward. Um, but I do look forward to participating in the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zaka. <coughs> Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, and thanks to the maker for presenting this before us today. Um, and I've appreciated Councillor McCarthy's public comments about the, the conversation around religious exemptions. As an Arab um, with, uh, with Arab sisters of, um, within sort of my cultural community that are Muslim, my father, uh, as, as you know, is Muslim, I worry about the, the role of religious attire, especially in this. So I appreciate Councillor McCarthy's public comment to that effect. Um, as well as those who may be undergoing medical <coughs> treatments and, and, and the like. And we need to um, make sure that through this conversation, we are balancing public safety with um, the ability to free, have free speech and, and uh, exist and, and have public protest in, in the public sphere. Uh, but most important is public safety. When we think about our roles as elected officials, and uh, the responsibility that we have to our constituents, to our residents, to our visitors to the city, public safety is paramount. Um, so keeping, um, keeping that, the, the religious exemptions on the table and making sure that that's a part of this conversation is really important to me because the implications can be, um, need to be considered for this. I also want to uh, just remind uh, this body that there is state law that exists about um, the limitations on, on covering one's face um, for, uh, for reasons to avoid the law, and that that conversation about that state law be a part of this conversation as well, whether it needs to be strengthened, reinforced here within the city limits, uh, shared widely, widely for uh, public consumption and public education. So I look forward to this hearing. I do ask that my name be added, and I look forward to participating, I think, in uh, some very deliberate and thoughtful and intentional conversation about this hearing order. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. I'd like to just thank my good colleague from District 5 and add my name. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? No. Nope. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Baker, Councillor Siomo, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Asabi George, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Garrison. Thank you. Sorry about that. I wanted to point at you. Um, at this time, docket 1292 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 1293 is withdrawn. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on to personnel orders. Docket number 1294, Councilor Campbell for Councilor Janey. <coughs> Councilor Janey sees suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1294. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1294 has been passed. Docket number 1295, Councilor Campbell for Councilor O'Malley. Council O'Malley seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1295. All those in favor of passage say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1295 has been passed. I am informed by the clerk that we have three late file matters. First, Madam, Madam Clerk, if you could read the first late file matter into the record. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Um, from the Office of Council Michael Flaherty, Boston City Council at Large, <clears throat> September 11, 2019. Actually, Madam Clerk, before you do that, just uh, for clarification purposes, um, if there are no objections to actually adding these three late file matters to the agenda, and just for clarification, one is a, a letter from our colleague about his absence today, two are, uh, uh, one is a hearing order and the other is a resolution. You should have the hearing order and the resolution on your desk. Does everyone have a copy of the hearing order and resolution? Yes? Okay. Um, seeing and hearing no objections, the three late file matters are added to today's agenda. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. If you could read the first late filed matter into the record. Thank you, Madam President. September, from the office of <clears throat> Boston City Council at Lodge, Michael Flaherty. Dear President <coughs> Campbell, please be advised that I will not be in attendance during today's Boston City Council meeting on Wednesday, September 11, 2019, due to a long-standing schedule commitment. I respectfully ask the City Clerk read this letter into the public record. Thank you. Regards, Michael Flaherty. The first late file matter will be placed on file. The second late file matter, offered by Councillor Kim Jamie, order for hearing regarding public safety during public demonstrations and assemblies and counter demonstrations. Whereas, in light of recent incident at the Straight Pride Parade and the counter protest rally in <clears throat> ensuring and maintaining the safety of all, com all the community of Boston, <coughs> to include bystanders, participants, counter demonstrators, and the police should be restated priority for the council. Whereas the right to assemble and peacefully protest are protected by the First Amendment of our U.S. Constitution as the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Therefore, be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council holds a hearing to examine <clears throat> to examine the conduct, including but not limited to the 36 arrests made by the use of non-lethal force and riot gear equipment in the Boston Police Department during the Straight Par Pride Parade. Representatives from the Boston Police Department, the Mayor's Office, and other city officials and other interested parties shall be invited to attend, filed in the Council on September 11, 2019. Uh, just a uh, friendly reminder, we try to shy away from late files just because they don't appear on the agenda, and that means that folks obviously in the public don't know about it beforehand. So just a friendly reminder that we want to be careful about late files. Um, Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Madam President. As I rise, um, I am very mindful that today is the 18th anniversary of 9-11, um, and we saw all over this country first responders in New York and at the Pentagon uh, respond, uh, very bravely respond to what at that time was very unknown. And so I make my comments in that context that I am someone who deeply respects our police officers, and you've heard many comments already from my colleagues, and I'm so glad that there are representatives that are still here in the chamber today. I know this meeting has gone on long, so thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do every single day to keep us safe. Um, I believe that this is an opportunity for us to have deeper conversation, and we've had several already based on the different hearing orders and resolutions that have been introduced today, but to have a deeper dive um, one, around how we do more to build community and build trust. I'm, I'm deeply concerned that we often talk about things uh, with this us versus them. You know, if we're doing something that says protesters should have the right to protest, then we're anti-police. If we say we want to make sure that our police officers are safe as they're doing their jobs, then we're somehow anti-protesters. Um, Boston, as we know, is the cradle of democracy and protecting our First Amendment rights to protest uh, when we think things are wrong, whether it is uh, workers who are out on strike uh, or people who are calling out what they saw as a straight hate parade. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. What I'm hoping for with this hearing order is that we can have a conversation around what it means uh, in our city um, when we're having, whether it's a big protest, it could be a sporting event, I mean, we are Boston, and so there are always opportunities for large crowds to gather, whether we're talking about a championship parade for one of our sporting uh, sports teams here, or whether it is a protest. And we need to make sure that everyone is safe, that our officers are equipped to do their job effectively uh, and have the appropriate training, um, and that protesters are not coming with ill will toward police officers or towards others. That when we talk about peaceful protests, that it is in fact uh, peaceful protest. And so I, as a counselor, and I hope all of you, really want to understand what the protocols are when dealing with large crowds. You know, what, when is it appropriate to use pepper spray? Um, when it is appropriate to bring in riot gear, for example. Um, and I think that is an important conversation, and it's, it's around uh, public safety, it's around accountability. 
Um, and it is to keep all of us safe. I do not uh, condone violence in any form, whether directed at protesters or directed at police officers. I think none of us are here saying that violence is, is okay. And um, I know that our police officers often do a very thankless job. Some, one of you already mentioned, I don't know if it was uh, Frank or Lydia, that uh, we as counselors often have to go into meetings and, and receive a lot of negative energy. And I'm sure that our police officers uh, have to do that as well. It is important, though, that we ensure that people who see something wrong and want to protest, that they feel that they can do so appropriately within the bounds of the law, obviously, uh, without uh, overzealous uh, treatment uh, or um, ag aggressive uh, behavior. And I'm not saying that the police here were being aggressive. I just think it is important that we understand as a body what the protocols are when we have large crowds gathering. And so I want to have a conversation to understand that better. I want to have a conversation <coughs> that gives us an update around um, our body cameras. I want to have a conversation that really gets at getting away from this us versus them, which I see play out too often. I think um, we obviously all need to feel safe. We obviously all need to feel like we can voice our opinions, whether that is coming to testify at a public meeting or going out to a protest rally. Um, so it is within that spirit that I, that I offer uh, this hearing order so that we can understand as a council and as a city what uh, the appropriate response is um, or, or not, and to make sure that we are all uh, being held accountable in that, and it is the role of this body to provide some oversight. And so I'm hopeful that as we continue these conversations around uh, face masks and, 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 and resolution that is now in the committee, that we can um, include this as well. So I hope folks will uh, sign on and certainly participate and what I hope will be um, a meaningful conversation uh, that helps us all understand how we can uh, live together in a way that is not this us versus them, uh, that we can respect our First Amendment rights, and that we can also respect uh, police officers as they try to do a difficult job. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add their name? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Baker, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flynn. At this time, the first late file matter will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. And we have one more late file matter. Um, in the <clears throat> offered by Councillor Kim Janey, resolution in support of full time non tenure track faculty at Boston University. Whereas the adjunct faculty of Boston University unionized with SEIU Local 509 in 2015 and are currently negotiating their second contract, therefore be it resolved that the Boston City Council hereby calls on Boston University to agree to a fair and equitable contract with the adjunct faculty that acknowledges the invaluable contributions of adjunct, adjunct faculty to the university, and be it further resolved that upon adoption of this resolution, the city clerk has requested to forward a copy of this resolution to Boston University and SEIU Local 509, filed on September 11, 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and I apologize uh, for the, the late file, and I'll be very brief. I know the hour is late. Um, this is a resolution to support full-time non-tenure tract faculty at Boston University. I recently did one for Northeastern. Uh, we see that uh, unionization has been under attack. Uh, we've already heard from my colleagues um, around support for Local 26 and why that was important. And it is important that we also stand with uh, workers here at Boston University. And so I offer this resolution and hope that my colleagues will sign on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Janey. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add their name? Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakem, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Baker, 
Councillor O'Malley, Councillor McCarthy, as well as the Chair. Councillor Flynn, would you like to speak on the matter? Yes, thank you, Madam Councilor President. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank um, Councillor Janey for, for this resolution. Um, I think any time a group of workers come together and want to organize, I think it's in the best interest of these workers. It protects them. It protects their family. It makes our city stronger. Um, unions help build our city. Unions help build our country. And with, with, with unions, it's a pathway, as <coughs> Councillor Janey and Councillor Edwards said, it's a pathway to the middle class. Um, so anytime a group of workers want to come together to organize, um, I think it's critical that we, we continue to support these workers yeah. to make sure that they're treated mm -hmm. fairly and treated with respect. And again, just want to say thank you to Councillor Janey. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Janey seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the third late file matter. All those in favor of passage say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The third late file matter has been passed. Uh, moving on to the green sheets, anybody wishing to remove a matter may do so now. Councillor Siomo, you have the floor. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, I'd like to pull page uh, a docket 1104 from page 2 of the green sheets, and detail can be found on page 19 of 19. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I believe that's docket 1104. Councillor Siomo? Yes. 19. If you could, uh, yes, Madam Clerk, if you can read it into the record, thank you. In, in the Committee on Ways and Means, <clears throat> excuse me, docket number 1104, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order approving an appropriation of $2,200,000 for the purpose of paying for the costs of feasibility study and schematic design work associated with renovation and new construction of a facility for the Josiah Quincy Upper School. Upon completion of the feasibility study, the City of Boston may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, said amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of Boston Public Schools. This was first assigned to committee on July 31st, 2019. A, a hearing was held on August 19, 2019, and on August 21st, 2019, uh, this matter received its first vote and was assigned for further action. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilor Stanley, you have the floor. I think the clerk said it all, so I'm <laughs> asking for the second <laughs> vote on that said docket. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Siomo. Councilor Siomo, who's chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, is seeking a second vote. We took a first uh, previously, um, and this is for docket 1104. This requires a roll call vote, so Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. <coughs> Councillor Siomo. Yes. Councillor Siomo, yes. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Sabi George. Yes. Councillor Sabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Garrison. Yes. Councillor Garrison, yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councillor Janey, yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Councillor McCarthy, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. Councillor Wu. Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. And Councillor Zakin. Councillor Zakin, yes. Madam President, receive the unanimous vote with one yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1104 has been passed. Anyone else looking to uh, remove a matter from the green sheets? Moving right along to the consent agenda, I'm informed by the clerk that there are three late file matters, which in the absence of objection will be added to the consent agenda. Hearing and seeing no objection, the late file matters are so added. The chair moves at this time for adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The consent agenda has been adopted. Any announcements? Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I rise today um, just to share why I have a bunch of um, beautiful pink roses on my table. Uh, Councilor O'Malley and I this morning uh, went to Davis and Savin, Sawin um, Florist in West Roxbury. They have for 18 years now, and today marks the 18th anniversary of September 11th. Um, by chance, on September 11th, 2001, they were hosting a Good Neighbor uh, Day in Councilor Siomo's district when they had a shop in mm -hmm. um, Brighton or Alston, Brighton. And uh, it, it really is this wonderful 
um, celebration of community and love and um, a way to celebrate good neighbors. So they give out, um, Council O'Malley, 14,000 roses mm -hmm. um, today. And you just come in and you get make a, a donation to the Boston Police Relief Association and just sort of how it happened and thinking about our first responders. And uh, we've had lots of conversations about our first responders today, but in particular on September 11th, we know how, um, how important our first responders are uh, in this city and thinking back to some of the tragedy we've had in the city. But today um, is also Good Neighbor Day. And, and as much as we reflect with sadness on what happened 18 years ago, uh, what has always happened for the last 18 years, uh, separate from the events of September 11th, the attacks of September 11th, has been this effort uh, by a local business, um, you know, just a, a, a couple that wanted to share some um, some uh, good cheer and love with, with their neighbors. So 14,000 roses being given out today, every year on September 11th, and Council O'Malley and I had um, got to run the store for a little bit this morning and, and hand out roses. So. Just wanted to share that because it is um, something special about today. I also want to add that today is uh, my middle sister's birthday, so happy birthday, Sonia, who's one of our school counselors, <laughs> Boston Public Schools, and tomorrow is my other sister's birthday, Sarah, so happy birthday to the two of them. Thank you. Happy birthday to them, and thank you for sharing. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I rise to offer uh, happy birthday wishes to <laughs> Councilor Savvy George's <laughs> sisters, uh, but also to Rosie. Uh, my mm -hmm. granddaughter started K-1 last week. She's now a VPS student, which is great. <laughs> and her fifth birthday is tomorrow. So I just wanted to wish her a happy birthday. Thank you. And we always love seeing her at the council. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Janey. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, I would like all colleagues and uh, guests and staff to please rise as we adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following individuals. And before I get to that, of course, I want to acknowledge um, that it is the 18th anniversary of September 11th, um, and we want to probably take a longer period of time today to stand in silence. Um, we have you know, colleagues who've lost people um, personally, who knew people involved. Um, and so it's an emotional day for some folks in this chamber, and I recognize that. Um, so we'll be taking a longer moment of silence, and then I'll read the names, and we'll take a long moment of silence. So thank you. For Councillor Zakem, Winifred Denise Clark. For Councillor Flynn, Flaherty, and Baker, Bob Sullivan. For Councillor Janey, Edwin, Aaron Edwards, Kala Jaden Henry, Hazel Williams. For Councillor Asabi George, Charles Michael Fluffy McMara, for Councillor Siomo, Maria Ma G and Frady, for Council O'Malley, Steve Sline, Doreen Conroy, Leonard Cropper, Fotios Cortez, and Michael Shea, and of course all those that were lost on September 11th, 18 years ago today. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those aforementioned individuals. And we are scheduled to meet again in this chamber on Wednesday, September 18th at 12 noon at Boston City Hall. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The council is adjourned.